Hello and welcome to our conversation with Lisa Kemmerer on sexism and the animal rights movement. I'm Jenny LaMorgan, owner of GreenWomanStore.com, where we partner with women entrepreneurs, writers, and artists to share their products and educate us all on issues important to us as women. Our guest, Lisa Kemmerer, is a philosopher activist and Professor of Philosophy and Religions at Montana State University Billings. Dr. Kemmerer is known internationally for social justice work on behalf of animals, the environment, and disempowered human beings. She has been an activist for decades, and she has written and edited nine books, including Animals and World Religions, Eating Earth, Dietary Choice, and Environmental Health. I love that one and Sister Species, Women, Animals, and Social Justice. The last two books are available on greenwoman.com, greenwomanstore.com. Thank you, and welcome, Lisa. Thank you. It's so good to hear your voice again. <laughs> Thank you for educating us on this subject. It's very timely. Uh, the headlines are highlighting male privilege everywhere in our culture, and sexism feels to me like sabotage, of human evolution, mm -hmm. um, and it's gone on way too long. So yes. addressing sexism is feels to me at, at this point about survival. Um, with mm -hmm. climate change and fascism threatening our existence, we really need women in leadership. And I know you feel this sense of urgency, and I thank you for that. And I thank you for getting it out there. All my work that I do, it's quiet, it's with books, it's with writing. And you make the connection. You reach out to people. And we have to reach out to people. Uh, especially right now. I think women's voices are loud and clear. We're rising around the world. And people are listening. You know, women who have been doing this work like yourself for decades are finally, um, their voices are being listened to and the work is is being accepted and acknowledged. So, and the other thing we really need that you offer, you you pull us together. Women need to pull together. Otherwise, our culture specifically and purposefully isolates us, and we can't do anything. But when we get together, it's, oh boy! Exactly. Then things change, and we change each other. Yeah, and, and that's we, what that's I right. hope with with yeah. Green Woman Store. It's not just a shopping site. If you go on there and see what other women are doing, peruse everything, and then you something will spark and you'll be ignited, you know, to to, yes. to walk your passion and create your, yes. your products or, or get your hands in the dirt and become a farmer like I want to do <laughs> and you want to do. Yes. So, um, so you're, you're right. We do. We kind of bounce off of each other. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes. We need more bouncing. Okay. So I want to start today with a quote from your introduction to Speaking Up for Animals, an anthology of women's voices. You say, the position of most women in patriarchal societies is closer to that of chickens and cows than mm -hmm. it is to that of the men who hold power. It is power we're talking about, isn't it, Lisa? Yes, and boy, did you pick a good quote to start with. I love it. I love it. So, so when I write that, I think of how I know, I mean, having, having, been a female, I know how I'm objectified. I know how men look at women's bodies as something for their purposes. I have had men try to use my body for their purposes without permission. And I think, I think most women have. I would be willing to say most. And I, I think that the current culture is showing that. And then when you connect that to chickens and pigs and cows, all of whom uh, the exploitation of the females is so much worse than the, well, I can't say worse, you never want to compare suffering, right? But what I can say is they suffer longer and they suffer some of the very worst, um, most egregious pains. So they suffer because they have female anatomy. So the cows are um, forcibly impregnated, they carry young, they give birth, their, their young are snatched away to become veal, very cruel, isolated little babies that are then killed young. But, the, but, the, but what is less publicized is how that mother, year after year, for nine months out of the year, she is milked and she never gets to tend her young. So she is being exploited as a female body. That's something I can relate to. And it's the same with chickens who are exploited for their eggs, and it's the same with sows uh, who are exploited 
for reproduction. And, you know, they all, the egg laying and the sows, they produce so many more young than what is natural because they are being exploited for the reproductive capacity. Wow. And, and in your writings, you cover some of the ways that people can see that connection between the exploitation of women and the exploitation of animals. And I want to share just one example that caught my eye. You write, the mammary glands of cows are exploited in order to produce a product that harms the mammary glands of women. Oh, Milk yeah. products have been linked with ovarian and breast cancer, as well as early onset menstruation. So explain these connections, the sexism. Yeah, so <clears throat> when our bodies are viewed from that uh, from that point of objectification of female anatomy, um, and when they're viewed as, I think the other important thing is uh, denigration. So one thing the ecofeminists have shown us is that we view the world in uh, in opposites. And one of the example is male females, if that's all that's existed. And we know that there's so many varieties of karyotypes. And but when they do it in a, when it is put in a dualistic view, male versus female, then the female is denigrated in relation to the male. And the way the eco feminists showed this is they created the um, the whole list of what is dichotomized. So on the right hand side, you'll have not just not male, but things that don't have reason. They're not abled. They're not of of mind. Uh, they're instead of bodies, they're not heterosexual, they're not white, so racism is part of that. They're not civilized, they're not human, so that's where the animals come in. And they're not productive, so anything that's denigrated is on that side, and everything on the other side is what's held in high self-esteem. So when you have things like taking the urine from mares, pregnant mares, so again, those mares are being cruelly exploited um, you know, they're, they're not allowed to be mothers. They're kept in horrible, tight conditions um, where they can't, where they can't move and they can't have a life. And it's because of their female anatomy. And then that is sold to women. And again, it's the, the assumption is there's something wrong with our biology that we're less than because we are not male. So going through menopause um, is not okay. So these these um, these products are sold to women, and they actually create greater problems because we're just fine how we are, thank you very much. <laughs> and if we're eating healthy and if we're exercising and if we're doing all of the things emotionally that we need to clear out before we get to menopause. So, and, and you know, I have never done Premarin, which is from uh, horse urine, you know, but I've done black cohosh for probably 20 years you know, mm -hmm. and it works just fine. So oh, God, I think yeah. there are alternatives, you know, to what you speak to. There's there alternatives are. to all of these animal Always. cruelty, yes. you know, yes. derived products. Mm -hmm. So Yes. And, of course, as I say, there's there's alternatives for those who choose it, and there's also just saying, I'm growing older and that's okay. That's what animals do. And I'm not here to please men's eyes. Um, I don't have to look like I'm 20 mm -hmm. when I'm 50, mm -hmm. and I don't have to look like I'm 50 when I'm 80. So just accepting that aging process and recognizing that our hatred of ourselves, that's a self-hatred that makes us so that we can't be okay with the wrinkles and the slowing down. And, the, and it's because we're sexualized. Women are valued as reproductive animals, just like cows and chickens. So when we age, we lose value. We're not cared about. Men gain value because they're all about who they are personally. Women are only valued mm -hmm. through men as sexual beings, as the child bearers, actually the son bearers for the men who want their name to go on in their sons, and they don't have a womb, so they have to exploit women's wombs. They have to claim women through marriage so they have that womb. So exactly. you can see how, yeah, all this points to us just not being okay with who we are. Right, and but I, I see it changing with the younger generations. You know, I, I, Boy. I hope, yes. I mean, I, I really feel feel a lot of hope for the world yes. because yes. women are rising and because yes. young people are rising and the attitudes yes. and the beliefs that they come into this world with are very different yes. than older generations. Yes. And yes, you and one of the things because you work with students all the time. I, yes. But of course I'm in Montana. But I will say that when I'm working like when I get into intersectionality and I'm working with people with of different nationalities and different backgrounds and different cultures 
things they understand just by dint of being women of color or having a sense of Latina culture and the U.S. culture. And when I went, mm -hmm. to, I was speaking in Europe, and the, I was with a group of young women there who are completely rejecting the he, she thing and have transformed their language. And I'm just, I mean, these, they are, they're so far ahead of anything I ever thought about being, even now, let alone when I was their age. So, yes, it's, it's wonderful. And they don't see difference. And I think that difference extends to other species. Mm. Yes, this group of women was definitely vegan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I see that with my grandchildren, too. So, and the sad thing um, is that the that the movement, the actual movement of animal liberation, is behind. It's largely white. It's it's too, way too male powered, and uh, that's that's creating real sexism, racism, real problems in our movement that we are not keeping up with the times. That we're very retro by comparison. Well, it's the sad. animal rights movement is outside the mainstream. And, and it's based on compassion and equality, so one would not expect that sexism and male privilege are common in, yes. in, your, in your movement. Um, yes. Or is that naive and wishful thinking? It's naive, yes. And this is, a, this is the thing I've been working on most in my writing right now, is that we have a very serious problem with um, sexism and racism and ableism and ageism. But the one I've been focusing on uh, is sexism. And looking at how we have a group that is 75% woman-powered, it was started by women. And when there was no money, there were the women doing what they do, you know, grass work, grassroots work. And then as it grew, men stepped in and, and, and they overwhelmingly take leadership roles. Now, initially, women actually wanted that. They recognized that, you know, if we're going to be heard, we're going to need some men leading this movement because, you know, no one who's going to listen to us. We are, we're on the not mm -hmm. A side. We are not reason. So we're kind of like the animals. No one's going to hear us. But if we get some men in there to say this is wrong, they'll hear it. So partly it was a strategy of the movement, but now it's just empowered men, and many of them with, you know, that many of them have strong backgrounds of wealth and, and privilege, and they just come into the movement, they found organizations, and uh, they control a lot of the wealth of the movement, and there's a lot of sexism in their organizations. There's a lot of sexual assault. There's people, there's groups of people who leave at once, all together, because of um, a serial sexual assault person in the movement, and there's several, or not in the movement, in their organization. There are several organizations right now. And then those males, too, if somebody gets driven out of a group for sexual assault, they're welcomed into one of the other male-led uh, organizations. This is a huge mm. problem. It's, and the mm. women who do all this work, instead of them being feeling empowered and safe in these organizations, they are exploited and kicked to the curb. And who cares if they leave? It's 75% woman run. There'll be more to take their places. And the men can continue to exploit the women in the organizations. I mean, this is just, this is just completely unacceptable. We have to face it. We have to deal with it. And we have to root out these men of power that are causing these problems. Wow. And this sounds so similar to, to the headlines today of the, the whole me Too movement, and yes. it sounds like we need to have yes. some Me Too um, hashtags do. going on within within your movement as well. Is there we anything do. in particular about there's the a hashtag right movement? Yes. Well, oh, wait, let, before I answer that, there's a hashtag Me Too AR, um, and it's Carol ah. Adams has started it. And yes, find that. There's also a survey being done. I'm doing a survey uh, for women, or well, actually for anyone who's been sexually assaulted in the movement. It's actually about any kind of harassment um, or, or, uh, or discrimination, so racism, the whole gamut. And it, there's a survey, yeah. and it's on canhad.org, and you should check out canhad.org. It's, it's a cross-the-board NGOs, uh, women, people of color, anybody who's been discriminated against or harassed can go there and leave their testimonials and find support and learn more about what to do. And the survey is, is on that canhad, C-A-N-H-A-D dot org, under testimonials, you can find the survey. And, and I am doing research so that we're not just talking about what's going on, we'll have mm -hmm. data. So I really need women to do that. Now, you were asking. Excellent, excellent. And we'll, we'll um, put that on social media too. Thank you for that. And then our newsletter. Thank you. <laughs> You know, Thank it's you. another way of um, of reaching out. And also, um, WFAN, Women, Women in Agriculture, 
network. I'll let them know about it too. They're oh, great. Like, as far as networking. Great. So great, thank you. All right. Uh, so, is there anything in particular in the animal rights movement that makes male privilege and sexism more problematic than it is in the larger culture? Is there oh, anything is there in particular? Ever. Is there ever? There's a whole <laughs> host of things. Yes, and. I think, first of all, I think we have to understand that in NGOs in general, it's a little worse. And this is something anyone can relate to, right? So what are NGOs about? They're about dedicated people trying to bring change. And they come right. together as community, and they have a very inward-facing loyalty. And like the early AR movement, they recognize the importance of having uh, male leadership and male power. So what happens is... Uh, men get into power and they start to enjoy their privilege. Now, remember, it comes from the larger culture. This isn't um, this doesn't start in NGOs. It comes from the larger culture and comes into the NGOs. But the thing about the NGOs is that they are inwardly looking and loyal. So, if they have a man who's misbehaving, um, they don't necessarily want the outside world to know about it. They don't, what their thought is, and this is especially true in the animal uh, liberation movement, and it's because animal liberation is are more marginalized than, let's say, those working against poverty. But there is a, a larger portion of people who recognize that what they're doing is good and right, I think. But with animal liberation, you know, you, it's a very small minority. And so whereas, especially things like working against poverty, who who is going to say, oh, those children should be starving? But many people will say, um, and I guess more will say too, racism isn't there, doesn't exist, and it's it's right if it is there. So you know, it's a little less true there. But it's definitely true in the uh, among the animal liberationists as well that we're marginalized because we're supporting something that most of the world doesn't care about. So women in the movement, who are the majority of the movement, want to protect the movement, and they're not going to find cause outside. They're not going to find a commonality outside the movement. So they, they often we come together, and that's what the earliest movement did. You come together for commonality and community, and then if there is even rape inside, you're not going to want to um, expose your little animal liberation community for being rotten. We don't want to do that. We want to say it's a good movement, it's a strong movement, and we're part of this movement. So many women just quietly leave and don't say or do anything and or move to different organizations and often, too often find the same thing. Now, if they go to a woman-powered organization, it's much less frequent. So mm -hmm. if you're going to support an organization, if you're going to be a volunteer, if you're going to become a member, please choose ones that have female leadership because leadership. those problems are so much, right. yes, mm -hmm, so much less. Well, I think with so NGOs, so non Non-governmental organizations, there's always the concern of affecting fundraising efforts. Yes. And that's yes. Now, now say that again. There's a concern of fundraising. Right. If you bring right. out any bad news yes. about the organization, you're now, going to affect fundraising. So glad you bring that up. Yes. So we have to keep those fundraisers happy, and so we can't show that our organization is dysfunctional. So, yes, that is a that is a huge part of it. Thank you for bringing that up. But there's another aspect of that, too, and that's that the actual donors are part of the problem. Many of the things the survey has started to show me is that CEOs are uh, perpetrators, Mm -hmm. Donors are perpetrators, and board members uh, will go to bat for – they will completely – I just recently had a case where a board member from a big organization, male run, basically insulted a woman, said she was sexually repressed, and they were trying to silence her because she was pointing out that there's sexism in this organization. So that was a mm -hmm. board member. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so these people of power and privilege, not you know, these aren't the these aren't the grassroots actors. These aren't these aren't the ones with their feet on the ground. They're but they hold the power, and yes, they are they are a huge part of the problem. And keeping those donors happy is part of that. And once that gets publicized, then the general public is not going to want to donate to that organization, and everybody's hurt. You know, the, the, even yes. the, the women who are yes. doing all the fundraising, doing all of the work, doing all of yes. the project yes. leadership, you know. They're yes. just not in leadership on the board. And and, and then the and the major decision-making. Yes. So this is why um, I say go with the female-run organizations. And, you know, we yeah. can't be afraid of this. We need to expose this problem and clean it up. We need mm -hmm. to drive these mm -hmm. men out of the movement, and we need to drive these organizations into the ground and out. It's it, mm -hmm. You know, there, we cannot – we can't keep going as we are. Our movement – 
as someone, and I've written a paper on it, and I've been working on it for six months, and it's soon to be published. And I will send you the link to that when it is. But it, it says some of the information from the survey, some of the statements from women, and it really shows this is a serious problem. We have to start addressing it. We have to face it and address it. Just like every other aspect of our society and our culture. Yep, we're just a microcosm. Yeah. But it's exactly. a little bit worse for those reasons, because of that inward-facing loyalty. And you know, there's one other reason I think it's worse in our movement. A woman, a, 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 many of the women are young in the movement, and anyone who's sensitive, who, anyone who can't leave a stray kitten on the side of the road, probably is going to have trouble figuring out when someone's putting the moves on them and saying clearly, don't do that to me. And a vegan who is marginalized in her larger community because she doesn't make choices like the rest of the community is also going to be uh, more disempowered. So I think for all of these reasons, uh, women in the movement become easier targets, sad to say. Well, and again, that's generally true in our population. Women need to stand up and get stronger, yes, and, I, and I think it's happening you know, if you look worldwide, it is happening, but it but it certainly needs to happen a lot more here in the United States. You know, we set an example for a lot of women around the world, and um, yes. sometimes I don't know why. <laughs> you know, yes. but yes, um, because when you're yeah, here and you live here and you see the oppression and you feel the oppression, you wonder, you know, why does the world look to us? But they do. You know, as well as we look to to other women around the world that are strong in, in Liberia, yes. and, you know, yes. women in Italy mm -hmm. talking about post patriarchy. You know, that all of that gives me so much strength. So yes. we do again it's it's our bouncing wealth. off of each other. Yeah. Yes, and, it, and I power. think it's only again, it, our power. It, yes, yeah. it's nothing good about us that makes us noticeable to the rest of the world. It's really all of our worst things. It's our capitalism, our power, and our misused power and wealth. And we spread all of our worst habits from Coca-Cola to factory farming around the world. Right. To, to water, water yes. oppression. Yes, yes that's okay. right. Mm -hmm. I know. So I think that this um, work you're doing with the survey and, and trying to weed it out is is important and a, another a way to shake out the problem of sexism. So what other things you. need to change, do you think, within the movement? And, uh, does it, so, and does it start with changing how we eat? Uh, yes, that's uh, certainly part of it because the oppressions are linked. So we have to get rid of our racism. We have to own it, find it, root it out. We need people of color in leadership positions because, let's face it, we're ignorant of our privilege, just like the men mm -hmm. are largely ignorant of their privilege, and we have mm -hmm. to we have to root out our own oppression, our own tendency toward oppression. And yes, then we have to. Um, and you know, this is one of the things that in I work with a bunch of feminists in different contexts, and one thing we really talk about is what is our responsibility to the men. Um, one thing I think that. Um, people of color have right is that to generally say, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help you a little, but it's, you need to fix it. It's your problem. You did it. You fix it. So, and I, mm -hmm. I've been blessed with wonderful people from Liz Ross to Breeze Harper that, that have helped me find books and strengthen my understanding and look deeper within, but not their responsibility. And so with with uh, with women and men, it's the same thing, you know. And I think each person kind of has to decide what their responsibility is to help uh, bring change. So some of the things that I think we can do: hire women, not just as leaders, but in our organizations. It's 75 percent women. Why are we, frankly, hiring any men? And I think um, when we're, if you're a donor, if you're a member, if you're a volunteer, go to organizations who have done that, who are led by women, and who are largely uh, women run. Let's see, what else would right. I do? Um, relationships. I think that when there are men, they need to not be having relationships in inside the organization. They need to look outside because it creates a whole lot of problems and, and the uh, survey is really showing this, the problems that that, mm -hmm. that that brings up. Another thing we can do, if someone says there's something wrong, there's something wrong. 
believe them, stand with them, hear them, and do what they ask. If they say, don't say anything, then don't say anything. If they say, um, I need help with this, what can we do, brainstorm, then do that. But stand with the oppressed when they come forward and say, this guy was racist, this guy was bullying me, this guy uh, sexually harassed me. Believe them. Believe them, and, and you can also be pretty sure there's going to be others out there. Um, there. We need to have policies in place. Every organization needs to have a publicly um, displayed policy against harassment and discrimination and a recurring required education. Right? Those are pretty simple things. And Vegan Outreach is now working on this. Tofurky has recently published a fantastic um, new policy against harassment. So these things are happening. Other things we can do, collective memory. One of the things that organizations do is they have this collective memory, and whoever's in power is who decides that collective memory is, what that's going to be. So um, with male leaders, they're going to, uh, they're going to really focus on um, male leadership. So we need to recreate these histories. We need to not let problems of organizations disappear, like the, how women have been treated. This needs to be part of the narrative. We need to own it and not hide it. Uh, and we also need to just get educated, all of us, about uh, overlapping oppressions, about what um, black scholars call intersectionality, but which I don't use because I don't want to steal their work or fail to represent it correctly. So these overlapping oppressions we need to all recognize as animal liberationists. That it isn't just about the animals. And in fact, we can't save the animals until we get our act together and get rid of sexism and racism and ableism and ageism and the destruction of the environment. They are all linked. Those are a few, I think, few of the things that I would, I would say we need to do. And, and you write about how we as women, as feminists, trying to uh, protect ourselves and gain power and leadership ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. How are we ever going to be able to do that if we're still allowing other mm. females of other species to be exploited and trampled on and treated poorly? So, so it's a whole. It's a, there's a continuum a there that I think that we're that we're not getting. And you know, as someone who's been in the animal liberation movement for, I don't know, 30 plus years, it's such a change for me to, to say the, that it can't just be about the animals. I would have, I would have never believed I would say that because, because my whole orientation is toward the suffering of animals and the work that, and I would do anything. I would have tolerated, just like what I'm seeing now, any sexism, uh, any, I would have put up with anything if I thought that's what it took to help farmed animals and animals in labs and to uh, make sure that dogs and cats have homes. Now I recognize that this it's a system of oppression, that this dualism, um, which others, all of, the, all of those that are oppressed, that's what we need to aim at. And if we're supporting one part of that, we are never going to get rid of another part, that it's all connected by this systematic oppression, and we need to get rid of the whole ball of wax. And so that really is seeing patriarchy as a whole system. And it's hard yes. to do that because here we are doing work in our own little areas and our own little pieces. And what you're doing with your work, I think, is really important. You're extending it out to include all areas of oppression, really. And maybe it starts with animal oppression, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, we're all connected and and I and I got that piece reading your work recently was about how we really need to not allow oppression in any area of our social organization. You know, it's it's. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, so one thing I'll go ahead. One thing I'll say is that we. The thing is here, I recognize we have limited energy. I don't expect the activists for animals or those fighting racism to do anything but that, and I think it's fantastic. Keep it up. Fight sexism. Fight racism. Fight the oppression of animals. But make sure your language and your behavior, you are educated on these other things, and that you aren't contributing to those other problems. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as a, as a, especially as a starting place, that's what I'd ask, and that's actually huge. If we could just do that. But I'm not saying that we have to, you know, 
we barely have time in our lives to do the activism that we want to get done in a day for one cause. But what I'm saying is make darn sure you aren't contributing to other oppressions. And that's the problem with the men, the white male empowered privileged leadership in the animal liberation movement. It's contributing to other oppressions. Mm -hmm. And, and other when you when you talk about the um, ability of of the CEOs who have been caught with sexual harassment moving to another organization and being um, accepted, that's so much what happens with our with our government that swinging yep. door between the government and yep. and agriculture and pharmaceuticals and Monsanto and you know everybody yep. keeps rotating around and so nothing changes. Yep, and and if if you will notice, there's been there was a big shakedown just within a month, and a huge powerful person in the movement has shifted positions and there's going to be another, I would guess, within a month. If you're watching, you can find out who these people are and you can also find out who is taking them on. So this stuff right now is really happening. So tune in, watch where people move who are uh, the big white male leadership in the movement. So where can we get news about changes and what's going on in the animal rights movement. You know, where where can we get news? I mean, we all have cable TV. I watch, you know, Farm Her and there's there's nothing about mm -hmm. this on that no, of course program. Not. Where can we get yeah, where can we get news about what's going on within the animal rights movement? Uh, boy, this is a hard question. So for about thirty years this has been going on. This is not new. Uh -huh. And and one of the problems is that for about 30 years, any time a woman does come forward, there's a lawsuit to try to silence the woman. And these men have a lot of power. they got big organizations with a lot of money. And, again, it's hard to find these online, but some of them you can find of women who have actually gone to court against these powerful men in the movement. They're in there. You have to look hard uh, because uh, these men have power and they can kind of hide things but they are there. But right now, Carol Adams has a blog um, in which much of this is being posted, and I can get you a link for that. And uh, okay. when, when we're all said and done, I'll make sure you have that. And Carol Adams is allowing, she is so wonderful, for so many years has been working in this field and um, continues. She doesn't lose hope. She doesn't lose energy. She has written The Sexual Politics of Meat and my personal favorite, The Pornography of Meat. And definitely check those out if you don't understand some of these interconnections. And uh, she is allowing anonymous postings on a blog site. And what we need is anonymous because it's not safe. Because if anyone comes forward, they will be sued by these. Again, this is the power structure and the male privilege. And uh, and that's why it continues. Is there's no, it's dangerous. You have to have a group of women coming forward, all of who haven't been paid off, and there have been a lot of them who have been given hush money. Just within the last year, a whole group of them were given hush money from one of these big organizations, right? And no one hears about this. They have hush money, wow. they walk, and the cycle starts again. Mm -hmm. And I know about these because I have the inside scoop, but how does anyone else hear it? Well, mm -hmm. that's not so easy. But believe me, it's going on. Check out, and I'll get you the link to Carol's blog, and we'll see how much of this. It's just starting. We'll see how much of this we can expose. All right, and and Tara, we have the sexual, what's it, the, the sexual politics of meat. We have that on the yes. Woman Store. Fantastic, and, we and that's her most famous. Yes, and we interviewed you and Carol Adams for the um, the feminism and sustainability uh, telethon. So there's talks by her as well. But I'll put the link up with your interview here. Fantastic, thank so, you. All right, so let me ask you how. If we start with changing how we eat, how does that help to shake out the problem of sexism and male privilege? Well, here's one of the problems. It doesn't. You have to be broader-minded. So we have this movement that's been going on for how long? And, and it has become a white, privileged, sexist, you know, it's just sad. You can't get there unless you open your mind and pay attention to the larger world, unless you get 
as a, again, that idea of intersectionality or overlapping oppressions until you understand that. And I could say this. I was part of the problem for many years. I didn't get it. I would have done anything for the animals, and I d completely didn't understand that there's a system of oppression. So mm -hmm. it's wonderful mm -hmm. to change your diet, and you are helping the earth, and you are helping the animals. Mm -hmm. But if you tolerate racism or sexism, you are hurting the animals, and you have to get that link. And get that connection. You have to get that mm -hmm. connection, and you have to start making those bigger changes in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's harder because well, then I, we're not we're more willing to change our diet than we are. Than okay, so the men in the movement they're more willing to change their diet than they are to give up their male privilege. And I will also say that the white people in the movement are more willing to change their diet for the animals that they love than to give up their white privilege or to even look at it or understand mm -hmm. it. And we have to. Mm -hmm. Male privilege, mm -hmm. white privilege, we've got to start seeing them and recognizing that it's all part of the same problem. So so that intersectionality that is becoming a part of our vocabulary now mm -hmm. and our, our um, awareness and observations, that mm -hmm. sounds, from what you're saying, it sounds as important as women rising. Mm -hmm. as young people oh, yep. bringing their new ideas into yep. the world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that intersectionality of, uh, that, of broadening each of our movements, each of our consciousness mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to, to en envelop the, the next one and the next one and the next one yeah. and the next one, like yeah. a, a domino, you know. And falling. if we are people like of compassion, all, why know. wouldn't we, Right. Right, 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 right. If we know, if we know, it's like you said, we have yes. to know. Education. You know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Education is, mm -hmm. you know, I did um, international work for many years when I was younger and at the UN, and it was all about education. Mm -hmm. And the only, um, with uh, IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the only group within IUCN that was not funded was the Education Commission, and they uh, were writing conservation strategies in 1986 that were being, uh, you know, adopted uh -huh. by countries around the world. The education, even at that level, was not recognized as being primary, and it is. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. And, you know, it this is. is why I'm an educator. It's, it yes. is. And it's why I went into teaching. I was not meant to be an academic. I don't consider myself an academic. But I care. But I care. It's my compassion that puts me here. And the students, you know, they drive me crazy because they're, they don't, they're not here because they really want to learn about ethics. They're just here to get their degree and go on and do whatever they're going to do. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we just have to tune in and care. And sometimes it takes longer. But everything we do is part of that puzzle, and education is critical. It's it's at the root, it's, and I it's I think you know that's being recognized. Well, particularly the education of women, and maybe that's what you're yeah. talking about. It's the education yeah. of women within the movement. You know, that we're the majority. To, exactly. It, yeah, mm -hmm. but but we can be a silent majority, or we can be an activist mm -hmm. majority. Yep. Which is that's what right, an do. informed activist majority that gets it. This right. is one of the beauties of Carol Adams. I feel like she got this from the time she was born. She just <laughs> got it. You know, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I would put on there Greta Gard is another one, Marty Keel, who's not with us anymore. These are some of the people, uh, Josephine Donovan, who have been part of this for 30 years or so, who got it early on. And, and mm -hmm. we, as, you know, they are the women who come before and a moment just to honor them to say their names. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. And, and you certainly, as an educator, um, you work every day with student citizens who will be leading the world in this, you know, leading this nation, but also nations of the world very soon. And I expect that we'll all be um, benefiting from that, and the world will be greatly improved by your efforts. So thank you for being an educator. Thank you. That is nice to yeah. hear. It is sure a yeah. hard job, but I also have hope. It's a job you're never done with. You never get to go home and put your feet up. <laughs> but right, I'm okay right, with that. Right, right. I get well, to do the things I love. It's motherhood. You're mothering the world. You know, it is true. It's, we're all, yeah, we're all mothers. And whether true. we have children or not, we're all mothers. Yes. And we, 
you know, that's what you're doing. So thank you thank for you. your hard work. <laughs> thank you. And I know yeah, for, your, for your exhaustion at the end of the day. So, so we're coming up at the end of our talk, and I'm thinking, um, is there anything else that you want to share with us that you want to leave us with? A thank you. A thank you to everyone out there who's an activist, a feminist, who cares about one another and the earth, because at the end of the day, that's what we need. So true, so true. Well, thank you, Lisa Kemmerer, for the thank important you, work you do and for teaching us here today. You are certainly part of the good news. And you're thank a woman you. leader. My pleasure. Yeah. So, we um, all must be. We all must be, that's right. By default, we must be. We must be women leaders. I mean, that is what's yes. going to change things and turn yes. things around. We must stand up and say what we know. Well, you've opened our eyes to an area of sexism and reasons for making change in our daily lives that we really do need to know about. So thank, thank you, you again for addressing the problem of sexism facing us today. And My pleasure. Giving us steps we can all take to ensure a better future for all species, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for getting the word out. All right. If you would like more information on Lisa and her work, please visit lisakemmerer.com. That's L-I-S-A-K-E-M-M-E-R-E-R.com, where you can invite Lisa to speak at your event and where you'll find more of her broadcasts and podcasts and articles and books and book reviews. And please support women-owned bookstores whenever possible. Our bookseller online, I call them the real Amazon, at uh, People Called Women Books in Toledo, Ohio. We'll order any book you're looking for, so click on our book site. Um, and thank you for joining us here at GreenWomanStore.com, where we believe the future is female and full of woman-identified sustainable solutions. Bye for now. Thank you.